Hello everybody, I'm Raphael Perry and it's time for some more Bloodsword. Now, we appear to be down underground in a great cavern, so let's take our heroes and pop them back in our big cave map. There we go, move them up to there, that looks good enough doesn't it? I do, yeah. Nice little zoom in, there we go. Lovely. I'm going to reread the last section from a previous episode, and we did heal this section already, so I'm not going to try again. The reason I'm reading this is to help give us a description of the options available and reference for how I may think about them and what I plan to do. You enter a vast natural cavern that stretches upwards into the darkness as far as you can see. The opposite walls are lost in gloom, and the only illumination comes from sudden flares of yellow sulphurous flame that flicker around crevices in the rock walls. You are, you think, on the foundation rock of the ancient city of Spite. Below the rock walls around you is the howling pit of the cauldron, and above you the route that leads up to the citadel. Even in these lower regions of their fortress, the Magi have made their presence felt. A strange desolate garden of desiccated plants and crumbling statues occupies the centre of the chamber. Here the gases seeping through the wall crevices create an eerie rustling noise, unpleasantly reminiscent of a den of rattlesnakes. The centre of the garden is lost in gloom where brittle-leaved cypresses rustle their withered boughs. Next to the garden, you can see a deep pit cut into the floor of the cavern. A roaring gale hurls, hurtles upwards from this hole, occasionally throwing up heavy bits of debris, whole chairs, ornate shields, boulders. These whirl around in the upper region of the cavern like autumn leaves before falling back to the cavern floor with a crack. You can dimly make out a prone body lying by the hole, its black cloak flapping incessantly in the air current and yet it has not been launched aloft. To the south, you can see a shadowy trellis work of rickety wooden stairs zigzagging up into the darknesses above. Yes, plural darkness. <laughs> a plurality of great shadows overhead. Occasionally the structure groans with the buffeting of the wind. On the north side of the chamber, there is a wide set of ceremonial stairs leading up to a bronze door. Now, let's, let's consider our options. Investigating the garden may contain some kind of serpentine or rat-like creature. Some sort of thing that we wouldn't hear because the sounds of the garden mask its presence. Hmm. I really want to search the body lying by the air shaft. I could take a look oh, oh, over the edge of the air shaft. What, and risk being hurled up with myself? That's not wise. Go to the rickety set of stairs to the south, or the wide set of stairs to the north. Now, the wide set of stairs to the north go to a large bronze door. If we are wanting to get into the city itself and head towards the most important places, the large bronze door and the large wide ceremonial stairs are probably the way to go. The rickety stairs to the south... Ah... Uh, it depends. This is go up the rickety set of stairs to the south, so it is committing to that path. We may not be able to return. My feeling is that those might lead to some kind of side chamber or storage chamber where we could possibly obtain useful items that we may need. However, it may be a path of no return. The body by the air shaft could be a trap. It could burst open and spread a foul putrescence over us all. Or it could get up and try and fight us. However, I want to go search for body first and foremost. 
Do you have the code word Wonderland? No, we are not Alice. Record the code word Wonderland on your character sheets. Guess what? We got it now. I'm not sure I'll bother keeping them in all caps, but you never know. At least we slew all the... Hmm. Route, none, and Wonderland. Why did the R not take and the shift key not take? Odd. Now, the code word chirograph. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, that word, sacerdote or sacerdote, probably sacerdote that I didn't recognise in the previous episode. The reason I did not recognise it is that it's not an English word. It's Spanish or Italian, possibly Latin, and it means a priest. I suspect, therefore, that it was not referring to the five true magi themselves, but to the five wizards who seem to be their cult high priests and leaders of the cultist followers. You push your way through the buffeting wind by the edge of the air shaft and roll over the body. You start back when you see that the body is in fact the skeleton of a man and only the grinning skull confronts you as you look down on the long dead corpse. I mean, it's hardly surprising. Swallowing your revulsion, you start to search for pockets of the man's cloak. In one of them, you find six files of liquid. You unstop a one and dip your finger into the green water inside. It tastes bitter and immediately you sense a change in your body. You begin to shrink by a centimetre or two. You try a bit more and again your body contracts. After a while the effects reverse itself. You have picked up six potions of diminution. Note them on your character sheet. That seems like something Remy would like very much. It also seems that it would be unwise to imbibe such a potion on the brink of a hole where a great wind is ready to hurl us upwards and dash us on the floor below when we finally come tumbling down into the garden or somewhere else in the great cavern. You can now enter the Garden of Dry Plants. I think I'll do that while we're still in the chamber. This is a new place and I would like to explore it a little. You enter the garden through the crumbling gate. The rustling of the brittle, desiccated leaves seems to grow in intensity. Broad pathways lead off in various directions and they are overhung by trellises of the same brown, dead leaves. You notice spores, not unlike dandelion heads, being blown around in circles on the floor by the wind. We could back out now or search further into the garden. The spores could be dangerous. I think we will try a little further into the garden. Ah, uh, it was 71, wasn't it? Wow. Uh, we gonna... hmm. As you pass through a dusty arbor, you hear a hissing sound. You react too late to prevent dozens of brown snakes dropping down on you from the petrified branches above. From one to six snakes will strike each player. You must roll your awareness or less on 3d6 to dodge the snakes, rolling separately for each. Each snake you fail to evade will bite you, inflicting 1d6 damage. Armour does not protect because the snakes find unprotected areas of flesh in which to sink their fangs. Anyone wounded will also lose one point from awareness because of the drowsiness caused by the snake's venom. It doesn't matter how many times the player was bitten, the awareness loss is always just one point. Oh, this could be bad. After one attempt at a bite, the snakes slide off into the desiccated undergrowth from the other side of the path. Dangerous, then. 
Okay, Remy. How many snakes? Five snakes. Of course. Wonderful. Uh, awareness on free dice. Oh, we are screwed. Okay, go for it, Remy. One, two, three, four, five. All right. Remy evades two, is struck by three. I wonder if we will be capable of curing this awareness loss at some point. But for now, we may have... Well, look, we got into some kind of nasty situation. There might be something further in. Uh, D6 each. Right, okay, Remy. Three dice. 15 damage. Ow. Okay. Uh, so, 15 and 6 is 21. Why didn't I just... Okay. So, Alwyn. And Remy, having been bitten, loses a point of awareness. This could be a problem going forwards. Six snakes for Sir Alwyn. Well, guess what? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, five of the snakes get him. Okay, this could be really bad. Twelve. All right, not so bad. Um, Brother Kern. Snakes drop on him. One snake. Yep, that snake gets him. Five points. Everyone's taking snake damage. And Ariadne. Six snakes. Great. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, yeah, they all get her. Okay. 16 points of ow. And, and a reduction of awareness. I do not know if we will find some powerful medicinal compound at some point, but ouch. Well, we'll continue with our newly gained disability. We've gone this far into the garden, we might as well go further. The rustling sound gets louder and louder as you go deeper into the maze-like garden. Thankfully, there are no more snakes. Suddenly, you distinctly hear the crunch of someone's footsteps on one of the piles of dry leaves to one side, but looking over there, you cannot see anything. What do you want to do? Well, it is at this point that Brother Kern would like to employ his power of paranormal sight. Using paranormal sight, you are able to see a group of strange spindly creatures which remind you of Daddy Longlegs, except they are the size of wolves. They are stepping angularly over the desiccated hedges that demarcate the garden paths. Just as your mystic senses penetrate their cloak of invisibility, one of them turns its proboscis towards you and emits a stream of spores. Because you had a split second's warning that the attack was coming, you can dodge the spores by rolling your awareness or less on two dice. It is reduced awareness. Any other players must make the roll... Well, everyone's going to just get this. We're going to die horribly. Okay. Remy. Yep, Remy gets the stuff. Alwyn. Yep. Ariadne. Yep. And Brother Kern, who has suitable warning, avoids whatever foul fate this is. Okay. 38, not 36. You are racked by a cough that feels as though it may split your lungs apart. Spitting, you see traces of grey fungus in your saliva. The spores are eating at you from within. Unless you have obtained immunity to disease from the Orb of Plague in Book 2, no we did not, every time you turn to a new entry, you must deduct one from your endurance. 
write diseased across the top of your character sheets in large letters so that you will remember. There is no obvious way to stop the spread of this horrible ailment. Not even magical healing will work. Your quest to prevent the Magi from returning to the world is now a race against your own mortality. Bloody hell. I mean, we may find some way. Before continuing, therefore, I'd like to make a two-point healing roll. Three-point healing roll. We spend three points. We get five times three, 15 points back. We'll get three points to Remy. And five points to everyone else. Wait. No. No, no. Yeah, okay, fine. Keep an even spread for now. Well, this playthrough just got more interesting, didn't it? Um, right, hang on. We're at a new section. Everyone takes a point of damage, apart from the healer. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting a sense this is not the run. We can make a run for it, or stand our ground. Look, let's investigate... Look, we're going to die. Let's investigate the garden, and then start again. You know. And because this is here, we'll take a two point healing roll for Brother Kern. Spends two points, gets two points back. Uh, he will drop one of those away to give to Ariadne. You're under attack from unseen creatures. The feel of them as they brush against you is of gigantic insects with sharp proboscises extended to seek your life blood. Your skin crawls as you summon the courage to fight back. There are one, two, three, four, five, six of these buggers. Right, okay. At least the deployment's simple enough. Um, they are invisible. They're not that potent. Should we be rolling additional... Because they're invisible, you must make your fight rolls against them on three dice instead of the usual two dice. This does not apply to the sage, though, as he or she can use paranormal sight to tell where the creatures are. I wonder if they would have sprayed at us if the sage had not looked at them. If, they, if the spray was a reaction to him noticing them. And if they would have just come in for a normal attack otherwise. Also, we're at a new section. The disease takes its toll. Right, uh, how do I want invisible things to look? Um, I've got an idea. Let's see what I can do. Here are our invisible creatures. They might look a bit blank, but I actually went and looked for an image of a pane of glass and tried to get a little bit of a murky reflection at the bottom of the image. So there we go. Right, uh, Remy and all the creatures go first. Um, Remy's a hard target, so he will step aside to here and engage this one. Oh, oh, bugger. Ah, uh, we got a problem. Okay, I see it. I see it. Don't worry. It's just going to hurt like hell. It will also fight him. Remy will attack first. And miss. The monster will use free dice to hit Remy because he's the trickster. And also miss. That's okay. Now, this one will come down to here and choose a victim. Uh, this 
one of these two will come to here. Uh, they have an awareness of seven, so they can go four. One, two, three, four. Okay, no, so they can't all get in. Two, four, that one can get in. That one can also get in, but not at the same time. So we'll pop it here and this one down here. All right. This one will randomize. It goes for Sir Alwyn. And just manages a hit for a pathetic 1d6 plus 2 damage. 8 points. Okay, 4 get through the armor. You know what? Sometimes bad things happen. Uh, this one will also attack him. And hit. And do one point of damage after armor. These are nasty monsters. They're entitled to beat us up and be horrible. It's exactly what we'd expect. This one picks a target. Uh, 1d2. Goes for the warrior again. And hits for... No damage. Takes on the armor. And this last one goes for Ariadne, who is wearing no armor to absorb the damage and suffers the full force of three points of damage. Yeah. Big ouch. Either there is some incredibly powerful treasure in here that we absolutely must have, or we should have never set foot in this place in the first place. And honestly, given how nasty it's been and the odds of us surviving unscathed, should probably have never set foot in here. Brother Kern will attack. He will strike normally and hit for 2d6 plus 1. 8 points. Yeah, they're tough monsters. I think they might kill us, in all honesty. So Alwyn will attack this, no he'll attack this one with the blood sword which will require three dice, so might actually miss. That's a hit, bizarrely. So 46 plus 2, 20, it's gone. And then he'll try and catch this one in his armoured gauntlet and crush its, crush its invisible throat. Highly unlikely, but here we go with three dice. That's a hit. 2d6 plus 2. 13. He absolutely does just that. If he's going down, he's going down like a hero. And speaking of which, Ariadne is going to try and cast that Nemesis Bolt spell. So we're looking at a d6 plus 5. That's too high. It is not cast. Okay, new round. Remy will attack this one as his awareness is no longer high enough to move around freely because he cannot see his target he misses it will return the favor and miss him also this one will move down and pick a target picking on remy we should have never come here it misses this one attacks Sir Alwyn, who is not a hard target and is definitely hit. There we go. Three points after armor. If we make it through this, it'll be a miracle. Right, and then this last one attacks Ariadne. Because it's a nasty bastard. Hits for 4 damage. Okay, we're really going to need to protect her in a bit. Uh, everyone's simultaneous. You know what? She will go first. And attempt to cast her spell again. 1d6 plus 4. That's successful. This monster is on the receiving end of 7d6 plus 7 damage. 26. It is obliterated, and she's finally got that spell out of her mind. Although, yikes. Yikes. 
Look, we got lots of healing potions, okay, and we're probably going to have to use them. Uh, Brother Kern will therefore move up and try and attack this one. Which he does successfully. Eight points reduces it to nine. They've taken eight points before. Right. And then Sir Alwyn will attempt to shoulder barge that one to death with his armoured pauldrons. Oh no, free dice, isn't it? Because it's invisible. That's a hit. 2d6 plus 2. Nine points. Absolutely crushes it to death with his shoulder to the face. And then applies the magic sword to this one. Which unfortunately misses, but we are fortunate to have a warrior in the party, even if he is diseased. Right, new round. Remy and the monsters. Uh, they will... This one will randomise a target. And select Remy. Oh joy. Here comes the first one. And the second. They both miss. Remy will attack this one, which Sir Alwyn cannot reach, on the premise that Sir Alwyn can probably murder that one if he gets the chance. Remy is also rolling free dice because he cannot see his target. Right. Brother Kern will move in and strike at the one the warrior cannot reach. He strikes hard and true. Eight damage. Okay. They like rolling eight for damage, don't they? Wow. Sir Alwyn will attempt to strike this one with his sword. Which he does. Reducing it to a mere two endurance points, which he will attempt to stamp on as it's like thrashing around on the ground. He stamps on it as it thrashes around on the ground. 2d6 plus two. It's only got two left. It is dead. Okay. Ariadne will prepare. Ooh, I want to go for a sword thrust spell. Because while she has truly mastered the art of spellcasting, it would seem that the Nemesis Bolt spell is not quite reliable enough yet. Remy will defend. The invisible creature will, top to bottom, go for the healer. It does not hit Brother Kern, who will strike back at it. He fails. Oh, this is a problem. Uh, so Sir Alwyn will move into position and attack because he can. Sword first. Hits. And fells the beast. The fight is at an end, but the party's pretty much dead at this point. We cannot use the golden snuffbox of Shormiano because it is no longer in our possession. Oof. All right. Everyone who's diseased takes a point of damage. So, in light of that, we will have Brother Kern attempt a free point healing roll. which he loses. As a result of that, Ariadne will drink her healing potion and recover 11 endurance points, taking her up to 21. 
the others are likely to do so in the not too distant future. In death, the creatures become partially visible. They are huge, angular, insectoid beings rather similar to Daddy Longlegs. The spores they emitted came from their thin, snout-like proboscises. Under your gaze, they collapse into a pile of matchstick thin limbs and cobweb wings. Uh, let's push deeper into the garden, because we're screwed anyway. Right. The disease takes its toll. And Brother Kern will attempt another three point healing roll. Spends three points, gets six points back. Uh, I will give three back to himself, two to Sir Alwyn. And one, wait, yeah, yeah, one to Ariadne, because we're going to need to keep healing her and she doesn't have armour. There's a clearing right in the heart of the garden. Bare, tree trunk, bare trees, trunks turned to stone by the centuries, stand around the perimeter of the clearing like brooding sentinels. You advance towards an old stone fountain set on a pedestal. Four stone gargoyles stare blindly out from the base of the pedestal. From the fountain itself, you catch a faint trickle of sound. We will absolutely take a closer look. It may cure the disease. Probably won't, but you never know. If it did cure the disease, what would be the point of it being here? Because... Unless the disease killed us by the time we got here, it wouldn't have mattered much. Oh, but we could have just left the garden and carried on. We will have a three-point healing roll from Brother Kern once again. He spends three points, gets back five times three, which is 15. He'll give the three to himself again, which gives us 12, which is four for everyone. Sure, we can just give him four each. Yeah, there we go. You step onto the podium and inspect the fountain. In a pool of crystal clear water you behold a copper amulet in the shape of a heart. You might expect it to be verdigris stained, but in fact the metal surface shines as if recently polished. Incredibly, there are small wild flowers growing here and clumps of green grass between the cracks in the stone rim of the fountain. Your choice is clear. You can reach in and take the amulet or leave it where it is. No, we will take the amulet. And I think Brother Kern will take it. The disease takes its toll on his companions. Uh, this would be slightly less tedious to manage if we had four players each doing this individually. The fact I have to do it once for each of the three individual characters, every section is going to bog things down a little. Uh, and we'll try a three-point healing roll while we're at it. Spend three points, get them back. Okay, fine. Simply finding a few stalks of fresh grass here in the centre of a petrified garden has given you hope. You reach into the water to touch the amulet, which you feel sure is the source of the life-giving energy. It seems to you that your fingers close around it, but when you try to lift it out of the fountain, it slips mysteriously from your grasp. Time after time you try to get the amulet, yet in vain. If you cannot obtain the amulet, you can at least drink. As you raise a handful of water to your lips, you experience a delicious coolness that no earthly draught can possess. A tingle runs through your veins as any wounds you may have taken earlier in the adventure are miraculously healed. If you are suffering the effects of disease or poison, they are cured also. So it was worth pressing on this far into the garden. Now. Oh, 
wait. That goes as well. Now, I have thoughts about this, right? So we essentially wasted a healing potion. But... Oh! Wait a minute. Poison. So our awareness returns to normal as well. It's actually reversing all the harms that were done to us in this place. If you were originally accompanied by companions who have been slain since you entered spite, no, we were not accompanied by any companions. I wonder how we would have probably through one of the other methods of trying to enter the city. So. Coming into the garden and getting poisoned and diseased was nasty. And then going further on in and finding the cure is almost enough to make you ask why apply the poison and disease in the first place. It's almost... A t well, first off, this healing is a nice way of making up for what happened. It's, it's like saying, hey, look, you came in here, it was hard, it was nasty, here you go, have a full heal, clean slate, clean bill of health, right? If we had fled out of here with our reduced awareness or even with our ongoing diseases without reaching the fountain, we would have struggled for the rest of the adventure and probably not made it out of here. No companions. I wonder if it would have returned them to life. You hurry back out of the garden. Somehow it's lifeless trees and dead, dry, dead bushes seem less threatening now you have seen the splash of hope at its centre. You feel as if your spirits have been completely reinvigorated for the coming battle of your arch foes, the Magi. So, it's not that we had to come in here to get the cure, it's the cure was here in case we came in here. And was a sort of test of faith to keep on keeping on boldly on the path. Speaking of which, the wooden trellis work stairs rattle sometimes and shake in the updraft from the shaft. They lead up towards the ceiling. There may be something helpful up there, but I suspect, like the garden, it's dangerous. Let us take the wide ceremonial stairway upwards. If you have the code word Gelid, we do not. I suspect we may be about to get it. The stairs are built on such a grand scale that you almost feel they were intended for a race of giants, so perhaps we can get a potion that makes us larger if we climb up the trellis. Clambering up them, your hair stands on end at the sight of a strange glyph worked into the surface of the bronze doors. Though you do not recognise it, still it gives you a sense of foreboding. We can continue to the top of the doors, or return to the cavern floor and choose another route. Ha. Huh. All right, so let's turn back as we have the option and go up the right. If we get blown about in the air from the shaft, I don't think that's going to particularly make us bigger. Oh, but it could make us lighter, right? Because for things get blown up in the air, it might not be that the air is particularly strong, but it makes the things that it blows lighter. Let's try the wooden trellis work stairs. I see the word dragon, the word greed. It is appropriate for dragons. Now, you'll make your way through the shadows that hang like drapes from the cavern roof. Looking up, you see that there are landings at erratic intervals up the staircase. It's like Blight Town in Dark Souls. Got it. But possibly even more rickety. The walls show signs of carving as you ascend, in contrast to the unworked rock of the cavern floor. And sometimes you pass archways that lead off into the 
lead off the stairway. The top of the staircase is completely enveloped in gloom. The further you go up, the more the wooden structure seems to heave in the air currents, howling up from the depths below. One of the landings you stumble into a, on one of the landings you stumble into a dead body. It is lying with its arm twisted beneath it at an angle which gives the impression that it fell from high above. Let us inspect the body and probably not ascend any further. Hardened though you are by years of adventuring, you cannot quite stifle a gasp when you turn the body over. The flesh of its face is crystallized, retaining an expression of ghastly fear even though the rest of the skin long since dried and turned to dust. The crystalline effect is particularly centered around the eyes, which are wide open. It seems strange to meet the frozen stare of a man who might have died a century ago. A book is clutched in the corpse's skirtle hand. If you take this, one of the players should note it on his or her character sheet. You can open the book at any time and read it at any time, except in the middle of combat. If and when you do so, turn to 493 to find out what's written inside. First, note down the number of the entry you're reading at the time, though, as 493 will not direct you back there. After making sure there is nothing else of interest on the body, you begin to advance up the stairway. No, we want to go down again! Right, well, Ariadne is going to take that book. Because it seems interesting. And she's going to look at it straight away. And if it's not some powerful spell, Brother Kern can take a look also. We are at section 351. First, make sure you have noted down the number of the previous entry. This entry will not guide you back there. The book is a compendium of Spite's history, including references to various demonic guardians and the ways of dealing with them. One page in particular catches your notice, having been circled in red ink. I was concerned the book may be poisoned and we might need to go back into the garden and face its invisible guardians once again. In the south of the garden hall, it reads, There ascends a stairway to a building known as the Tower of the Crystal Gaze. In this tower roost the deaf angels, strange flying creatures which behave as docilely as pigeons in the presence of the magi, but which attack any stranger without hesitation. Anyone who looks into the eyes of a deaf angel will surely die. Thus it is best to go blindfolded or carry abrasive dust to cast into these creatures' eyes. You flip through the book, but you cannot find anything else that seems immediately useful. You do find the title of the work, A History of Spite Since the Blasting by Hordred, Abbot of Lear Monastery. Return to the last entry you were reading. In a PDF you can go back using Alt plus left arrow, which apparently means I can do this. There we go. It did not work. It just took me back to the top of the page. So 351. And we now continue to ascend. We may desire to blindfold ourselves or go the bleep down. You are now climbing into an area of gloom, unilluminated by the torch fires burning on the cavern walls below. As you get higher, the metal stanchions that hold the staircase to the wall begin to groan in protest at the unaccustomed burden. Every so often the whole structure shifts sickeningly under you, throwing you against the flimsy banisters. The cavern floor is far below now, but to judge by the worked stone of the walls, you have entered one of the towers of spite. Peering up, you dimly see black shapes moving to and fro in the gloom of the rafters. They give the impression of being like great bats or cadaverous crows. You see their eyes turning towards you, shining pale yellow in the darkness like guttering oil lamps. A chill runs through your bones at the sight of those glaring eyes. Uh, okay, we want to blindfold ourselves, I think, and then send in the sage. Well, 
Which of the following will you use now? The blood sword, a file containing the potion of diminution, or a handful of diamond dust? Uh, well, the blood sword is all we've got. Crikey. You hold the blood sword up and point it in the direction of the dark rafters above. The end of the blade suddenly blossoms with magical energy and a crackling light illuminates the furthest crannies of the ceiling. The bat-like creatures that were just about to launch themselves down towards you are blinded and disoriented. Many of them fly off into the darkness, but three of them are left. Cawing with rage, they fly down towards you. Oh, bugger. Angels of death. It would be pointless to try and flee. They would have dropped down on your pack before you had gone a dozen paces. Let's see if we can win. And I'm blatantly going to use pictures of weeping angels from Doctor Who for this. Awesome. Here are our angels of death. And clearly we are marching up some kind of spiral staircase now. With Remy in the lead once again. It would seem at this point that either the angels of death are so blinded by the blood sword that they will not kill us by looking at us. Or we will be asked after the fight, did they damage you? And if they did, we may be rather screwed. All right. Well, they're going to go first. So they're kind of blinded, but not that badly blinded because they can still fight us. This angel will attack Remy. He's Remy, though, so he's hard to hit. He's not that hard to hit, though, apparently. Remy suffers damage. Five points after armor. Now, it has occurred to me that before mounting the mechanical bird, I should probably have investigated the blue portal with the piles of equipment beside it. Not necessarily with the intent of making use of it, but because the port, the equipment may have been of use to us. However, it's also worth noting that it was to do with the blue magi, and he's still of illusion, so the equipment was probably no use to us. This angel will pick a target. I say angel. It goes for Remy. Remy is hard to hit. Yes, he is, and Remy is not hit. And the final one will therefore attack Brother Kern, who is not so hard to hit. And takes damage. Seven. That's going to be five points after armor. We're going to need to do something about that rather quickly. Also, we can't... Ooh, yeah, all right. Okay. Remy will attack. Um, 21 health. No, he'll just attack this one. Okay, sure. That's a hit. Is it plus one or plus two damage now for Remy? It's plus one. Okay. Three points. Not great. Chip away at the monster, but it's a start. Brother Kern will defend. He has been wounded. So Alwyn will not defend. He will pummel this thing with two attacks. Hits with the blood sword. Why did I even roll? And hits with the not blood sword attack. Huh, I'm getting an. It's not worth giving him a second weapon unless it's a magical weapon. Until that point, he can just punch and kick and throw his weight around, crush things against walls, stuff like that. S curb stomp him into the ground. Right, so the blood sword itself. 4d6 plus 2. Maybe enough. That was rubbish. And 2d6 plus 2. It, ro it rolled 6 on 4 dice. So that means there must have been at least 4 ones there. Possibly 5 ones. No, no, there must have been at least three, 2 ones and 2 twos, or 3 ones and a 3. It's the only two combinations. So 7 and 8 is 15. Look, 
It's some damage. It's not enough, but it's something. And Ariadne will prepare... Sheet Lightning. Wait, no, she's got a Sword Thrust prepared. We'll just cast that. Sword Thrust is a level 2 spell. Yes. Five, that is successfully cast. She will pick a victim to receive 3d6 plus 3 damage. Um, the one attacking Brother Kern would be a great choice. However, the one attacking Remy could die to... Wait, I'd have to roll a 15. Okay, no, we'll, we'll go for the one attacking... Oh, this is rough because we need to... Yeah, Sir Alwyn is not going to be able to attack. Okay, yes, for one attacking Brother Kern. 3d6 plus 3 is 18 damage. Should have gone for the one fighting Remy after all. It's okay. Round 2. The Angels of Death will attack. The first one will attack Remy. Remy is a hard target. And so its blow does not strike true. The second will pick a target. Chooses Remy, who is hard to hit but not that hard and actually takes some damage. Seven points is five after armor. Remy's in pain a little bit, but we have a healer. Speaking of which, the last one will attack the healer who is defending to be a hard target and it will hit. Oh, that's nasty. Okay. Five damage is free after armor. Brother Kern is missing his old charm of shielding. However, it is at this point that Remy will attack. Um, Remy would, mm, no, no. We'll give the warrior something to do. Remy will attack the one that only he can reach. And misses. Brother Kern will attack the one that's been attacking him because it has only three endurance points left. Hopefully, he does not miss. Indeed, he does not. 2d6 plus 1. Six points. Beats it to death with his quarterstaff. And then Sir Alwyn will apply a sword to this 6 health monster, which hits automatically because it's fighting prowess 12 of the sword. 46 plus 2, minimum 6 damage. I don't even need to roll damage. It is destroyed. And Ariadne will look at the situation and prepare another sword thrust spell. Uh, she doesn't have armor anymore, so I should remove her armor stat. And there's our Sword Frost spell in action once again. The Angel of Death will attack Remy. Remy is a hard target and is not hit. Remy will strike back, like the Empire, but better. Better enough to do some damage. And he does 10 points of damage. Excellent. I think... This thing is a goner. Brother Kern will not waste an arrow on it. So Alwyn will not be able to attack. Ariadne will attempt to cast her spell. 1d6 plus 2. 7 is a success. Take that sword for our spell and ram it right into this creature's heart. Let's do some damage. 12 points. Ends the fight. Mercifully. Now, hopefully, there will be some kind of important treasure, like the Gelid keyword, that we can get from here before heading back down to the cavern below. Our foes are defeated. Amid a flurry of swart... Swart? As in swart, uh, swart musty plumage, the last of the monsters drops into the darkness below. 
If any players died because of looking into a deaf angel's eyes, nope, we used the blood sword. If not, you can now continue on to the top of the stairs. Okay. You reach the topmost landing. Looking down, you can see the cavern floor, all but swallowed in gloom a hundred metres below. There is one exit from here, a glass doorway with no obvious handle. To reach it, you have to pass along a narrow walkway which has no handrail. Given no alternative, you edge carefully... Can't we just go down to the cave? Given no alternative, you edge carefully along it. As you do, you glance once more down into the depths below. A dizzying drop. It would not do to slip now. Reaching the door, you begin to run your fingers over the glass surface, searching for a catch or hidden lever that would open it. Then you notice a flicker of movement from beyond the door. You peer through. It is difficult to see. The surface is scratched and dirty. But through the glass, you discern an approaching figure. As it gets nearer, you can make some sense out of a distorted jumble of images. It looks as though a massive minotaur is thundering straight towards you, its horned head lowered to smash the glass. We need to get off this narrow balcony. You are rooted to the spot for an instant, watching it hurtle closer. The glass pane must be quite thick because the Minotaur's charge is eerily silent. All the same, you do not suppose it is thick enough to break the force of the charge. Your options are to get ready to dodge the Minotaur when it bursts through the glass window or stand your ground so as to meet its attack blow for blow. Each player in the party should decide without conferring. Uh... Dodging is going to involve either awareness or it's going to mean we're all stupid enough to step off the platform. Ooh, narrow walkway. Dodging on a narrow walkway has got to be really bad. I'm thinking stand ground, warrior in front with the blood sword and the sage making a two... Sure. Three point healing roll. This could be a disaster. It is. We lose three points. Uh, we will position ourselves like this. Arrows at the ready. Either. Please be an illusion. <laughs> Oh, it's not, is it? It's white. It's not... Oh, God. Okay. Well. I've made my decision. Let's turn off the grid. Either we all dodge and it goes hurtling past, or it doesn't come through the glass, or it comes through and if we don't dodge, it knocks us all off. Um, We all stood our ground. You adopt a solid fighting stance and wait to meet the Minotaur head on. Its shadowy shape grows larger beyond the door until it fills the frame. Then you hear a crash as the glass shatters and you shield your eyes from the thousands of flying fragments. Each player loses 1d6 endurance owing to minor cuts. Subtract half your armor rating rounding down from the damage taken. You are sure you're about to be swept off the walkway by the unstoppable force of the Minotaur's charge, but nothing happens. When you look up, you discover that there is nothing there. All that lies beyond the now shattered door is an empty passage. The Minotaur was just some sort of optical illusion enchanted into the glass pane to make us all dodge and fall off the walkway. No doubt. I still feel I should go back down to the cavern below, but okay, everyone's taking d6 damage. So Alwyn's taking four points. Two are ignored for armor. Remy is taking three points, one on the armor, so two down to 24. Brother Kern will suffer three points, takes one off for armor, so two down to 17. And Ariadne will suffer two points with no armor because she has no armor. And because this is not a combat section, we'll have a two-point healing roll for Brother Kern. Spends two points, gets them back. 
he will give both to himself because everyone else is pretty healthy. You step through the shattered remnants of the glass pane and into a long corridor. Demonic faces with inverted leers are engraved all along the stone walls, seeming to watch your progress. At the end of the corridor you find a massive iron-bound portal of red wood. It is difficult to push open because beyond it a fierce wind is raging, in which case I'm thinking a two-point healing roll is in order. Spend two points, get four points back. Uh, he'll give them both to himself, taking him up to a 19. Because everyone else is in much better shape than him currently. We seem to be falling into the might and magic trap of the priest class being the best healer, but being so inept in combat that they end up spending most of their power healing themselves. You step up out onto a balcony from which a bridge extends over to another of the ruined towers. The wind buffets you as you advance, forcing you to grip the balustrade with all your strength to avoid being blown off into the gulf below. Above you can see low pearl grey clouds drawing back like curtains from the crystal black vault of the night sky. Five small stars shine down on spite. The five magi await their return to the world they left two centuries ago. The sight of them gives you a renewed sense of urgency. Reaching the edge of the bridge, you open the door into the tower and rush through, pulling the door shut behind you to block out the shrieking gale. Maybe the big bronze door is just a nasty trap. The room in front of you is filled with a drifting cloud of white haze. Waving the vapour aside from your, with your hands, you step forward. You seem to be in a long, robing chamber. Cloaks hang from pegs on the wall, disintegrating when you touch them. You are passing along this room when you see a figure approaching you through the mist from a side passage. Just as you are about to call out, you recognise the features of your old friend, Emeritus of Quadrille. He starts when he sees you, and then a broad smile of recognition lights up his face. Praise the Saviour, he cries joyfully. I have sought you over all the land of craft these last twelve months, but I had no news of you, so I journeyed here by myself, knowing that I alone might stand between humankind and the return of the despotic Magi. Now you are here to aid me. My prayers could not have been answered in better fashion. So saying, he embraces you, and you smell the familiar odour of herbs and salves which you associate with his profession. Now, he says, we have little time to lose, for I have just discovered the resting place of the mortal bodies of the five magi, a crypt whence their acolytes dragged them after their colleagues were slain at the blasting. It lies down this corridor, but caution, he adds, for the way is full of ancient traps. I wonder... If this is a trap and he's here to trick us. You follow him down the side passage to a small chamber. There are five curtained alcoves in the far wall. He steps on forward and immediately an arrow flies out of a hidden slot or to one side of the room and caroms off the stone wall by his ear. He wipes his brow and steps forward again gingerly. We do have a sage. Paranormal sight would probably help us here greatly and we have an enchanter who could cast the detect magic or detect spells or detect enchantment, whatever it's called. This wasn't if you have a sage and may want to do something, this was just if you have a sage. Do you want to help out your old comrade? Perhaps if you used your paranormal sight on the curtains in front of the alcove, you would be able to spot any further traps. We're not going to let Emeritus do this on his own. That could be disastrous. Emeritus seems to guess what you're thinking. Pish tosh, he cries. I don't need any of that jiggery pokery to find the right door. The real magic, my friend, is knowledge itself, and I have done my research before coming here, I can assure you. However, he doesn't seem to know which flagstones are trapped. Since he seems rather petulant about your intervention, perhaps you should let him find the safe route on his own. 
I think we should utilize our paranormal sight, regardless of hurting Emeritus's feelings, especially if he's trying to trick us into triggering the traps ourselves and it's not really him. You'll have to help Emeritus in spite of himself. As you begin to summon up your mystic power of vision, you decide that Emeritus needn't know unless you actually have to step in to save him from a trap. However, you are totally unprepared for the shocking sight that does meet your eyes. Not only can you see a door at the back of each curtained alcove, but the human form of your old friend disappears to be replaced by a hideous, unhuman monstrosity. It has a wheezing, spongy body and a purple-veined head like a giant octopus. You recognize it from an old bestiary you read in the scriptorium on the island of Caxos. It is a planetor mutabilis a rare creature that is said to roam the hills of Asmulia before the founding of Salentium. It has the power to read men's minds and present itself in the illusory guise of someone known and trusted its blatantly a mind flare. Turn to 112 to give battle, but you have one free round before normal combat begins because you are forewarned of its imminent attack. Now, this whole section is addressed to the sage. So the implication may be that only the sage gets one full round of battle. However, since the only thing in italics is the name Planetor Mutabilis, it applies to the whole party. Bizarrely. Well, let's go find a picture of a Mind Flare then. So here is our legally distinct tentacle monster. It's like the brain flare. No wait, it's mind flare. What's it in fighting fantasy? It's the brain slayer, I think, possibly. But in this case, it's the planetor mutabilis. Sorry, planetor mutabilis. Also here described as the mirage monster. The thing you fought was your old friend lunges forwards on thick, quivering legs that remind you of a snail's foot. Even more disturbing is the way it presents snatches of image or sound from your own memory as it fights you, so that at one moment you might look into the faces of your parents, the next you hear the voice of Icon or smell the perfumed scent of Fatima's garden. All players, except the warrior, must reduce their fighting prowess and awareness by one for the duration of this combat, because of the distraction caused by the illusions. The warrior is not distracted, so Alwyn knows how to fight. Interesting. In which case... Seven... Ooh. This gets interesting then. Six and six of resort initiative we do have a surprise round let's absolutely apply violence to the situation uh we'll stand remy in front of the healer sorry sir alwyn in front of the healer and send remy up they're both going to attack we'll get as much damage as we can so Alwyn will hit it with the blood sword straight away. No questions asked. Obviously, Brother Kern will call out something like, That's not Emeritus of Quadrille! By which point it's already turning its head towards the blade and takes 15 points of damage. Okay. You know what? This is proper old school Mind Flayer stats where they were like level 8, level 9 monsters that could absolutely desecrate entire parties without even using their psychic abilities. <laughs> and psychic abilities this thing does have. Uh, after that, Sir Alwyn will kick it in the where its balls should be, just in case it still has some. If it's a real Mind Flare, it won't, because they will have atrophied and withered away, because Mind Flares don't use those to reproduce. And he kicks it in the where its bull should be for a nine point kick to the gut. Bloody hell, almost as dangerous as the sword. Down to 32. Remy's coming in clutch here. 
with a I'm thinking quick thinking here because this is a really nasty monster okay Remy can you hit it remember you have minus one fighting prowess that will therefore miss which makes this fight suddenly turn rather nasty Brother Kern will hold back. He needs to preserve his endurance for healing. And Ariadne will prepare. I want to go Nemesis Bolt, right? This thing is really nasty. Now, the downside of Nemesis Bolt is she'll need to roll a 2 to cast it, 3 on the next round, 4 on the next round, by which point Sir Alwyn may have slain it. New round. The Planetor Mutabilis will do something funky. As well as striking with its horny beak, it also knows four spells that it might use. Roll a die each round to decide what it does. It will... Might as well roll a d2. But, okay, it will attack with its beak. It will pick a victim, any victim, top to bottom... It goes for Remy because he's a hard target and it hits him. No, it doesn't. It misses. Just. Remy will fight back with the obvious disadvantage that he is already experiencing and land a hit after all. Oh dear. Uh, our nemesis bolt may be wasted. 7 knocks out 32 down to a 25. The creature is already seriously injured. At this point, Sir Alwyn will butcher it rather brutally with a bloodsword for 46 plus 2. 10 points. Man, low damage rolls. But 15. He will beat it with his armoured fist. That is a miss. Excellent. At which point Brother Kern will defend and Ariadne will attempt to cast her spell. Proud of the fact she might actually get to do so. A nine is not quite good enough. The Planetor Mutabilis, being extremely cacton, will... Prepare a spell. Okay. The spells it knows are Servile Enthrallment. Ghastly Touch, Sheet Lightning, and The Vampire. Okay, Servile Enthrallment, Mind Blast. Or Charm, Dominate type thing. Ghastly Touch will allow it to recover health. Sheet Lightning would be... The, no, Sheet Lightning would be the Mind Blast because it would hit us all. Um, it's probably... I think it needs to gamble on the Ghastly Touch, if I am cor correct. Ghastly Touch is not the Vampire spell. Um, yeah, Sheet Lightning then. Uh, the Vampire spell. Okay, we'll go for Vampire spell, just in case it lives long enough. Which it won't, because Remy might miss. Remy does not miss. Eight points. Knocks it down to seven. Then it gets hit with the blood sword, which probably finishes the fight, to be honest. Thirteen points of damage. Not massive, but enough. And we have a Nemesis Bolt spell in mind. I'm going to keep this here with no endurance, just in case we need it again. That was, however, a rather nasty... That could have turned much nastier. But we got okay. The creature finally stops writhing, only giving out occasional spasmodic twitches. You can now see that it was carrying a Hydra Fang. One player can take this. Note it down on your character sheet if you do. 
The Hydrofang can be used once to create a warrior to aid you in combat. This summoned being will act just like any just like another party member and will obey the holder of the fang. Its attributes are followed are as follows. This sounds like a warrior item. Now I'm gonna let you on a little secret here. Obviously, this is a Jason and the Argonauts reference. However, the Sons of the Dragon's Teeth in the original tale are not skeletons. They are mortal warriors and the teeth are from a dragon that was slain by a previous Greek hero named Cadmus who sailed east across the ocean and found this land and tamed the two bronze bulls and slew the dragon and kept its teeth. And then when Jason comes to Colchis, the, is it King Aetes, I believe, the king of Colchis, summons the sons of the dragon's teeth and Jason tosses a stone among them. Wait, no, no, it's Cadmus who defeats the sons of the dragon's teeth. Yeah. Uh, essentially, the dragon was never a hydra. Yeah, because cause Medea sings a song and puts the dragon to sleep, so Jason is able to steal the Golden Fleece and escape without it. I know my stories. I know my stuff. Yeah. I'll look up a suitably Greek portrait for this warrior when we need him. The summoned warrior will fight in one combat only. The fang will disappear after it is used. We can't use it as an offhand weapon. We can imagine we're using it as an offhand weapon until we use it to summon a warrior, okay? When you are ready... There are five wooden doors behind the curtains. You open each in turn. All give on to long corridors, the furthest ends of which are shrouded in darkness. At about the halfway point of your vision down each corridor, there is a small ornately carved table and a chair blocking the passageway. The first four chairs from left to right are empty, and in each of these corridors you can dimly make out a white-robed figure walking away from you into the darkness at the end of the corridor. As you watch, they seem to fade from view altogether, and possibly from existence. In the fifth corridor, you see an old man wearing an antique white cloak and a circlet of white silver over his brow. He seems to be waiting for someone to come down the corridor. Well, we wouldn't like to disappoint him. However, I think this episode's gone on for quite long enough, and this is probably a good time to end it. I'm imagining this may be one of the five magi, and we may be able to defeat him here while the other four are not available yet. I don't think their mortal bodies are here. I think they're going to be summoned into the sacrificial victims of the cult as possessed bodies, or even into the five high priests. For now, though, yeah, I'm ending this one here. There's been plenty of action, plenty of fights, lots of investigation. And we didn't get to go through the door I wanted to because I wanted to check out another avenue first. But so far, it seems we've done reasonably well. Also, this is a non-combat section. We'll try a two-point healing roll for Brother Kern while, I'm, while we're still here. He spends two points, gets back eight. So we will give six to him, taking him back up to 25. He's still at the lowest endurance total, but a lot closer to the others. That about wraps... No, he's not. Remy's down on 24. Okay. That about wraps things up for here. I hope you've all enjoyed this episode, especially with the legally distinct Mind Flayer, for copyright reasons, and I will look forward to seeing you all in the very next episode. I'll say goodbye for now, though. Cheerio, everyone. See you all soon. <laughs>